Hey everybody, uh, here I am, Dr. Lisa. I'm giving a guest lecture in uh, Dr. Fennell's biodegradation and bioremediation course. And uh, so, so far this semester, I think that Donna has mostly been talking with you about uh, biodegradation type experiments that have been done in the lab, right? And she's talked about a lot about what can happen, what bacteria can do, um, and what I want to talk to you a little bit today is about how do you determine whether uh, these things that are theoretically happening uh, in the environment that, that can theoretically happen, that we know happen in the lab, do they actually happen over here in like the real world, right? Do they actually happen? Um, and the way that I approach this question is by doing data mining on the, the data that exists for field sites. And this is, uh, you know, it's something that I like, I'm good at it, but it's, it's not, you know, it doesn't stand alone. These two approaches, the laboratories, which show what can theoretically ha be happening, the laboratory studies and the environmental studies, the data mining showing what actually happens are complementary. You know, we need both sides of the equation to really understand what's happening in some of these systems. So uh, the, the, the idea of data mining is using data that was collected for some other purpose frequently, uh, and using it to try to figure out what's going on in terms of degradation at your site or, or whatever question you're trying to answer. So sometimes the data was collected specifically to look at the question you want to look at, but more, more often you're using whatever data you have, uh, and it was collected for some other purpose, and that's an opportunity and a challenge at the same time. So one of the keys, some of the keys to data mining are, are figuring out where to find the data that you want. Uh, and particularly as regards to biodegradation, th they very frequently don't measure the products of the biodegradation, so you have to figure out what's going on based on the disappearance of stuff. But if you can find uh, products that have been measured, that's terrific. But knowing where to find the data, uh, knowing where to find the ancillary data, things like temperature, wind speed, water flow rates, redox potentials, uh, soil properties, you know, where do you find that kind of ancillary data that might help you understand whatever biodegradation is happening at a site? That is often a very difficult because um, it wasn't even data that was collected by the same research group. It might have been collected by the USGS in terms of river flow or by the National Weather Service in terms of meteorology. So very difficult sometimes to find that. And then uh, the third thing there is having the expertise to understand what you find when you apply some of your data mining models. You know, there's a lot of data people out there that are much, much better programmers than I am. Uh, they understand the data, they can work with the numbers, they can crunch them, but they know nothing about biodegradation or about environmental science, and so they have no way of understanding the output of these models. And so you have to have a little bit of both. You have to know some data mining, but you also have to know a lot of environmental science and biodegradation and microbiology to understand what's really happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a bunch of case studies. The first one, I'm going to talk about the dechlorination of PCBs, uh, which, as it turns out, happens not just in uh, aquatic sediments, but also happens in sewers and in groundwater and in landfills and apparently lots of other places. So we knew from uh, microcosm studies that bacteria can dechlorinate PCBs, and we have one field site where this has definitely been shown, and that is the Upper Hudson River, where in the aquatic sediments of the Upper Hudson River, bacteria were dechlorinating the crap out of the PCBs. Um, and we know based on these studies that uh, there's different types of bacteria that can mediate this. One of them is the chloroflexi. They use these organochlorine compounds as their electron acceptor. So right now I'm talking about PCBs. Uh, in a few minutes I'll talk about dioxins and per, uh, chlorinated ethylenes and chlorinated benzenes and even brominated flame retardants. Uh, all of these halogenated compounds can be used as electron acceptors by the bacteria. And in the case of PCBs, the bacteria are usually able to remove the chlorines at the meta and para position, right, which is over here, meta and para. These are sort of the outer positions, the three, four, five positions on the ring. These chlorines can be removed but the bacteria have a harder time removing the chlorines at the ortho positions, the two and the six positions. And so that leads you to characteristic end products like PCB4 here, which has two chlorines left and they're both in the two position, they're both ortho. And then PCB19 has three chlorines left and all three of them are in the ortho position. 
So those are the key indicators. Those are the end products that you look for. Uh, so you remove some of the chlorines, but not all of the chlorines. And so the product of these reactions is still a PCB molecule, and therefore it still gets measured um, when you do a, a measurement of all 209 PCBs. So this is the great thing about it. The products are measured. So uh, Donna Bedard and other people have looked at the different pathways by which this can happen, depending, you know, which, which chlorines are removed first. Sometimes they're in the para position, sometimes they're in the meta. Sometimes they're flanked, meaning there's another chlorine right next to it. Sometimes they're not flanked. Uh, and so we know that there are comp, there are air chlor, there are, eh, there are PCB congeners that, you know, all the PCB congeners are given a number from one to 209. And so here's a couple of congeners, 132 and 153, that are abundant in the aerochlores, which are the formulations, the PCB formulations that were manufactured by Monsanto in North America. Um, and so these, on the left, these congeners are very common. You know, the 132 and the 153, these are, these are common uh, congeners that are found in the aerochlores. And uh, the bacteria like to remove flanked and doubly flanked metachlorines and so you end up with congeners like 51 and 47, and you can look for those as characteristic sort of intermediate products because they've got four chlorines left each. Uh, but they still have a chlorine or two in, that are not in the ortho position. So they still can be dechlorinated, but all the flanked chlorines are gone. So these could build up as kind of intermediates. Uh, and then, as I've said before, the final product usually is something like PCB4, PCB19, which have nothing but ortho chlorines left. So the way that I've been investigating this is to use this factor analysis approach. I use a thing called positive matrix factorization, PMF. You can take my class on data mining in the fall and I will teach you all about PMF. Uh, but basically it's, it's deconvoluting the data and looking for patterns. It's looking for uh, groups of PCB congeners that co-vary, that, that track along with each other. You know, when PCB4 is high, PCB19 is also high. Um, and so you apply this, this model to your data and it basically splits your data up into a small number of fingerprints that represent sources. And then it tells you how abundant each of those fingerprints is in every single sample. So this example, I use data from the Delaware River Basin Commission. This was their dischargers. All the people that discharge that have a NIPTES permit to discharge into the Delaware River have to measure PCBs in their effluent. They have to measure all 209 PCBs, but some of them are always below detection limit. So we throw those out and we end up with 89 peaks. Some of those peaks have more than one PCB congener in them because no matter how hard you try, you can't separate all 209 into 209 peaks on a chromatogram. So 89 peaks, some of which represent more than one congener. And we had um, 500, when I did this, there were 546 samples of effluent from all of these dischargers. And some of the, there were 100 different dischargers. And some of the dischargers, a small subset of the dischargers actually chose to measure PCBs in their influent, which turned out to be really helpful. So we put those two together. I had almost 650 samples, 645 samples times 89 peaks. That's a big data set, even by my standards. That's a pretty big data set. So I ran it through my PMF program and it said that there were seven factors, seven source types or fingerprints that described the, the vast majority of the data. So three of them looked like the original aerochlores. This is so this these are this is the abundance, this is a percent on the y-axis, and if you add up each of these bars, they will add up to a hundred percent. And then across the uh, x-axis here, this is the PCB number right, from 1 to 209, so as you get to higher PCB numbers, these PCBs with higher numbers have more chlorines on them. And so when you see this sort of Gaussian bell curve distribution, you're usually looking at an aerochlor, and in fact this is aerochlor 1248, 1254, and 1260. So that was three of the factors. Um, two of the factors that you find in the Delaware River are related to PCBs that are produced not from aerochlors, but inadvertently. Um, I won't go into that too much, but there, when you make titanium dioxide, you, well, you start with titanium tetrachloride, and then that gets converted to the titanium dioxide, which is that bright white pigment that gets used in everything that's bright white. Um, when you make that stuff, if you use a certain process to make it, you'll end up with high molecular weight PCBs over here. And then PCB11 comes from other pigments, or organic pigments that are used in all kinds of printing and paper and even on clothing and stuff. 
Uh, and so PCB11 is a marker for, for those kinds of things. So that's five. And then the remaining two um, fingerprints that got spit up by the PMF program, one of them was dominated. Here's PCB4, right? And the other one in red here is PCB19. And so that is what I'm calling the advanced dechlorination factor because 4 and 19 have 2 and 3 chlorines, respectively. And then the last factor uh, was dominated by uh, PCB congeners that have 4 chlorines. Um, and there's some co-eluters here, but remember on that previous slide I said that 47 and 51 were indicators of sort of a partial dechlorination. So that's where that's coming from. This is what we're calling the partial dechlorination signal. So when you see those two fingerprints, you have evidence that dechlorination did occur in these real-world samples. Okay, so that's indications that dechlorination did occur in the real world. And then you also get the abundance of each of these fingerprints in every single sample. So you can look at them, and this is just a composite by looking at all of the samples. Um, in the dark blue is the three aerochlor fingerprints, so that's about three quarters of all the PCBs being emitted. Uh, and then over here are the two things that are associated with the pigments. That's a small fraction, 9%. But then here in the orange and the yellow, or excuse me, the orange and the red are the dechlor dechlorination fingerprints. So that's almost 19%, rounding its 18% of total PCB loads to the Delaware River from these NIPTES permitted dischargers. Um, and that's a lot of transformation for, for PCBs, which are considered to be persistent. So that tells you that, that you know dechlorination is happening, and there's a fair amount of dechlorination happening. And then you can look sample by sample, and the samples with the highest amount of that advanced dechlorination signal in them, um, these are all places where there was PCB contamination in the groundwater, and the NIPTES permit was to pump up the groundwater, treat it, and discharge it to the river. So Philadelphia Shipyard, that was used to be the Navy Yard, the U.S. Steel Plant. Uh, Bridgeport Disposal and General Chemical are both places that just took in waste from other uh, facilities and, and repackaged it and transported it out and they weren't very careful uh, and so there was lots of spills and, and all kinds of stuff happening there and very contaminated groundwater. Uh, and then here you have a, a, a plant that does nothing but treat landfill leachate. So that's a big indicator. There's a big amount of dechlorination products in their effluent which is an indicator that the dechlorination was happening in the wastewater, or excuse me, somewhere here and most likely in the landfill. Uh, again, these are all um, places with contaminated groundwater, so that's an indication that, that the dechlorination is happening in the groundwater and in the landfills. And then I also found a lot of this dechlorination signal coming from the wastewater treatment plants. Um, and so this, I was trying to figure out why, you know, what is, what is the, the, the scenario that is causing this to happen, and I couldn't figure out, I was, I was trying everything I, th I could think of, so one of the things I did is I plotted the amount of the, this dechlorination factor versus the log of the flow rate of the plant, which really was not that helpful, uh, but I had these five plants here that had a ton of dechlorination, and I was talking to my buddy at DRBC, and I said, what, is th what do these things have in common? It's the three Philadelphia plants, um, the one from Camden, and the one from, I think it was from um, Delaware, from, from, um, the big city in Delaware, <laughs> whose name I can't remember, Newark. Uh, and he said, oh, well, those are the only plants in our system that have combined sewers. And I went, aha. So there's something going on with combined sewers. Uh, by the way, there's also another plant here that treats a lot of landfill leachate. 20% of their flow is landfill leachate, and they also have a lot of dechlorination products in there. So this is an indicator that the dechlorination is happening somewhere. And then it turns out that many of these places had measured the PCBs in their influent as well as their effluent, and the dechlorination products were in the influent. So this wasn't happening in the plant itself, it was happening upstream, which means this must be happening in the sewer system. Sewers are very anaerobic, uh, they ha harbor lots of bacteria, they've got plenty of food for the bacteria to eat. Uh, what they lack is a lot of oxygen, and so these chlorinated compounds are acting as the electron acceptors in the place of oxygen for all these bacteria uh, all the bacteria in the sewer. So that was, you know, just an example of how you can use data mining to show that dechlorination of PCBs is actually occurring and then try to tease out exactly where. And since I did that study, I've done a, a several others. So here's the Delaware River dischargers that I just talked to you about. Uh, this is the ambient water from the New York, New Jersey Harbor. So this represents the dechlorination products coming down from the Upper Hudson River. So PCB4 and 19 are in red and the 44 and 45, which are the intermediate products, are in green here. 
So we knew this was happening. You know, every, people have known for a long time that, that PCBs are being dechlorinated in the sediment in the upper Hudson River. Here you see it coming out of the sewers, the landfills, and the groundwater. And then I went and looked at the dischargers, meaning the wastewater treatment plants discharging to the New York, New Jersey Harbor, saw the same thing. You know, again, dechlorination products. Uh, so these are plants that either uh, treat, you know, uh, sewage from the sewers or treat uh, like the, the fresh kills landfill leachate is one of those in here. So lots of dechlorination products there. And then I also looked at ambient water from the Portland Harbor Superfund site. I wasn't looking for dechlorination. I was actually just looking to see what was going on there and who was responsible for the PCBs at that Superfund site. And I found a whole bunch of dechlorination going on there. Uh, and I tried to track this down and figure out where it was coming from. And it's pretty clear it's coming from the groundwater. Uh, that there's a huge inflows of groundwater into the Portland Harbor, the, the, the water column there. It's the, the ground is relatively porous. Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's almost like a steep canyon, and so the groundwater comes flowing in really rapidly and is carrying in dechlorination products. And that actually was a big deal um, for the EPA in the region. The EPA was really happy to see my results, not because they care at all about dechlorination of PCBs. They couldn't care less. But they were really excited to see evidence that groundwater was an important source of PCBs to the to the site because they had been arguing this for a while, and were not ha they were having trouble convincing the judge and the the people involved in this in this case that uh, people who were responsible for groundwater contamination should also have to pay for the cleanup of the harbor because the groundwater contamination was getting into the harbor. As a sidebar, um, I looked when I was doing the study on the um, New York, New Jersey Harbor dischargers and also in Portland Harbor, I noticed that uh, where you see the dechlorination products of PCBs, so again, here's 4 and 19. So this is a fingerprint that's associated with dechlorination of PCBs. And when you combine that with the dioxins in the same data set and run it, you get a fingerprint here that's associated with dechlorination. And it's got a, finger, a very strange dioxin part of the fingerprint, which is also uh, characteristic of dechlorination. So octochlorodioxin is the most abundant of all the dioxins. It shows up, I mean, it's like 80% of all the dioxins everywhere you go. And so the fact that it's not a particularly abundant congener here is kind of a big deal. Normally OCDD would dominate this fingerprint, but it doesn't. What dominates is the one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight hepta CDD here, this this big bar right here. Um, and then here's a hepta CDF. And so what's happening here is the OCDD, because it's the most abundant of all the dioxins, it's being dechlorinated to the hepta. And it's happening at the same time as the PCBs. And that makes sense. So the, the bacteria that can use PCBs and dechlorinate them are also dechlorinating the dioxins at the same time. So I was able to show that this was happening both in the Portland Harbor Superfund site and in those New York, New Jersey dischargers because I had the right data. You know, you needed to have both dioxins and PCBs measured in the same samples. So, you know, implications, dechlorination is, is more widespread than we originally thought. Uh, many facilities are sort of inadvertently using in situ bioremediation of PCBs, and it's quite successful. So could we enhance that? Uh, this is happening all up and down the Delaware River and all throughout the New York, New Jersey Harbor. And so it seems that there's no shortage of dechlorinating bacteria that are ready to just go to town as long as they get favorable conditions. Um, so that is an important message about how you, you know, do you really need to seed with bacteria or are the bacteria just naturally present? Maybe you don't need to bother. Maybe the bacteria are always there. Um, one of the other implications is that if you find dechlorination products of PCBs or dioxins in sediment in a river, you have to ask yourself, well, did that happen in the sediment or did it happen in the sewer, which then maybe discharged either through a wastewater treatment plant or through a combined sewer overflow, discharged into the river and contaminated the sediment that way. Uh, that's uh, been an issue in the Passaic River. People have argued that dechlorination of dioxins is occurring in the Passaic. I would argue that it's not happening in the Passaic. It's happening in the sewers. Sewers are warm. They have plenty of electron donor. Uh, they've got plenty of nutrients, very favorable conditions. They're basically, they're, they're just little bioreactors, whereas sediments are cold. They don't have as much nutrients. They don't have as much um, electron donor, and they're less likely to be anaerobic. Sediments are more more likely, and they could, could be anaerobic, but they're more likely to be aerobic. So I would argue that it's happening in the, in the sewers, not in the sediment. 
Uh, and there's some evidence that other things like dioxins are being dehalogenated along with the PCBs. So um, we learned a lot. You know, we learned a lot about the dechlorination of PCBs just by, by using this data mining strategy. So the next uh, case study I was going to give you is about uh, cytochrome P450, metabolism of PCBs. So this is an interesting counterpoint. We're still talking about PCBs, but the difference here is that the products were not measured. They don't measure the products of the SIP metabolism, uh, at least not routinely. So what happens is here's your PCB molecule. It gets attacked by cytochrome P450. Cytochrome P450 wants to add an oxygen across two carbons, and those two carbons both have to be unsubstituted meaning that they have hydrogen, but they don't have anything else. They don't have chlorines. So you need to have those two adjacent open positions in order to get this to work. And not all PCBs have that. So not all PCBs can undergo this metabolism, and that's, that's the fact that we use to diagnose what's happening. Um, notice that once you hydroxylate this, or once you add the oxygen, then that epoxide splits open and you get a hydroxylated PCB as one of the products here. And these hydroxylated PCBs are quite toxic. Uh, there's some evidence that they are more toxic than the parent PCBs. So this is very ironic because the, the cytochrome P450 metabolism pathway is designed to detoxify things, but it may actually have the reverse effect of actually making some PCB conjugates more toxic. Okay, so uh, we looked at, so this is some, again, PMF results from fish. The top panel here is Ericlor 1260. This is the fingerprint of Ericlor 1260. And notice these two um, groups of co-eluting congeners, 147 and 149, they co-elute, and 153 and 168, they co-elute. And in the uh, Ericlor, they're, they're what I call the twin towers. They're about equally tall. Their ratio is 0.99, pretty close to 1. And then when we ran this uh, model, our PMF model on fish from the Hanford nuclear site, which just happened to be the data set that I had, um, we see a fingerprint that looks a lot like the original 1260, the R squared, the similarity is high, it's 0.77. And still 147, 149, 153, 168, the twin towers are still standing tall. But then we also saw a fingerprint where a lot of these different congeners are gone. Uh, a lot of the a lot of these in here have disappeared, and what you're left with is the big four, right? These four groups of congeners, and notice 147 and 149 is gone. It's it's almost completely gone. So that now the ratio here is 0.05. It's gone from one all the way down to 0.05. So most of the 147 and 149 is gone. And this totally fits with predictions based on the structure of the PCB molecules by this guy Boone. He published a, a paper where he said, okay, these are the congeners that can be metabolized, and these are the congeners that cannot. And this totally fits with what he said. The congeners that remain, the big four congeners that remain in this bottom panel, are you know, the ones that you would expect based on his structure activity relationships, and you would totally expect that 147 and 149 would disappear. So I've actually been using this ratio as a measure of the extent of metabolism of PCBs. So that's, you know, again, how you can use data mining, you can use this PMF technique, and you can say something about the, the degradation of, of PCBs by this cytochrome P450 metabolism. So this, what you're looking at here is fish. Uh, I also did this model on otter scat. <laughs> you can go out and measure poop from otters, and it doesn't hurt the otter. You know, because nobody's, you know, they let you catch fish and grind them up and measure PCBs in them. But no one's going to let you catch otters and grind them up because uh, otters tend to be, they're cute, they're mammals, and sometimes they're endangered. So you can't, you can't grind up the otter, but you can go collect samples of otter poop uh, and measure PCBs in them. And so this is um, the results I got. I did my PMF model. I got six different factors. Uh, that's the bar chart here that, that on, on, the, on the right here. Um, and two of these factors are very weathered, meaning very metabolized. These two are very metabolized. And uh, in these panels on the left here, that's the, the blue and the yellow are these two very metabolized patterns. So these are otters from the green slash Duwamish River, which the Duwamish River is the river that, that flows through Seattle. Uh, and so up here, this is concentration in the otter scat in picograms per gram. And this is way upstream here 
up in the Green River where things are pretty clean. This is like up in the Rocky Mountains and there's not a lot of PCBs. And then you get to down here, these three sites are within Seattle. And so these are much more contaminated. You know, Seattle was a very industrial city, especially during World War II when they were producing ships and airplanes and stuff. Boeing, you know, is in Seattle and they were producing all these airplanes to fight World War II and using PCBs. And so that, that whole area of Seattle is pretty contaminated. So the Otter Scat reflects that. Um, and then the lower panel, instead of doing it in terms of concentration, this is as a percent of total. So these are the six different factors as a percent of total PCBs in the Otter Scat. And the point is that the blue and the yellow together are about two thirds of all the PCBs coming out of the otters. So they show signs of major, major metabolism. And even some of these others, you know, he so here's the Twin Towers standing tall, uh, but here's two places where the Twin Towers, one of the Twin Towers has fallen. Um, so there's a lot of metabolism. I mean, I was actually shocked. I, I, I shouldn't have been because people did know this, but uh, the vast majority of the PCBs in your body do get metabolized. Uh, I, maybe not the vast majority, but you know, two thirds or more of the PCBs that enter your body do get metabolized. Uh, so it's actually surprising that they do bioaccumulate as much as they do because a lot of metabolism does occur. Okay, so otter scat, and then here's same same sort of analysis for benthic organisms. Uh, these are clams and worms, lumbriculus variegatus, and, and mussels. These are all from the Portland Harbor Superfund site. So this is a story about good data. Uh, Portland Harbor Superfund site has a gigantic database of, of wonderful, wonderful data. And what, what they did here is they were going out and collecting sediments. And so they were using a ponar and they were scooping up, you know, big, big scoops of sediment from the bottom of the harbor. And when they did that, if they found clams or lumbriculus variegatus worms or mussels, they set them aside as separate samples. So that's why we have uh, clams and mussels from this site. Uh, and we have them paired with the sediment. So the upper panel is in the biota here. That, that wasn't very well. That wasn't very good. Um, but the upper panel is the biota. Try that again. Biota. There we go. That's the biota. And the lower panel is the sediment. Okay. And they're paired. So if you look at, you know, like this one is paired with that one. Okay. So you have lots of the dark purple is Aerochlor 1260. And the light purple is the metabolized version of 1260. So here in the sediment, you have a lot of 1260 on this sample right here. And then in that corresponding biota sample, yeah, you also have a lot of 1260, but it's been heavily metabolized. And so the t couple of take home messages, one is that the, the, the biota are totally reflecting what they're eating in the sediment. You know, there's a clear correlation. More 1260 in the sediment means more 1260 in the organism. It's just that what's in the organism has been metabolized. Uh, but the big take home message here is that even at these low trophic levels of clams and worms, uh, these organisms can metabolize PCBs. And I, apparently I thought that this was like not a big deal. But then when I showed this to my friend Kevin Farley, he said, oh, this is a big deal. Um, nobody's really shown this before or, or it's, it's been sort of hinted at, but nobody's had good evidence to show that these lower trophic levels actually do metabolize uh, PCBs. So this is a good paper that we wrote a couple years ago. And then, um, so that's, we talked about otters, we talked about fish, uh, we're talking about clams and mussels here, and then here's a whole bunch of other species, uh, again, from the Green Duwamish River area. Um, amphipods, butter clams, all different types of benthic organisms here, different species of fish, and even of shellfish. So all of them, again, same color scheme, the dark purple is Aerochlor 1260, and the light purple is the metabolized version of 1260. And so all of these species are doing some metabolism, but some species do a lot more than others. So brown rockfish are metabolizing like crazy, but gooey duck, not so much. So big differences among species as to how much they metabolize. Um, so, so we've learned a lot about the cytochrome P450 metabolism for PCBs. Uh, I have some sort of ongoing questions about this. I'm wondering whether the cytochrome P450 metabolism pathway, because it involves the addition of oxygen and the formation of the epoxide, that is very similar to aerobic degradation. That's what bacteria do usually when they're doing aerobic degradation of aromatics. And so I'm wondering whether you would get a similar similar alterations in the PCB congener fingerprints if you had aerobic degradation going on. I, so far, I've never been able to see this in, in the field, and it would be great if I could. 
I think the problem is that um, PCBs, first of all, just don't get metabolized, don't get aerobically degraded that often. Uh, but when they do, it's the low molecular weight congeners and they just go away and it's hard to see any difference between different congeners being degraded more than others because they have so few chlorines that they have, they're all metabolizable. None of them are blocked because they don't have enough chlorines to really be blocked. But this is a, a bigger question about how do you di diagnose whether aerobic degradation is happening in a field site? Again, we all know it can happen in little jars in the lab. That's not a problem. But how do you figure out whether it's happening out in the real world? Aerobic degradation is really tough. It's something I've been thinking about. Don't have a good answer. Uh, but that's why I'm wondering whether maybe some of the, what we've learned about the cytochrome P450 metabolism would tell us something about aerobic degradation. Um, my other question is whether the PCBDFs are being metabolized as well. Uh, th this is the 2378, right? 2378 tetrachlorodibenzodioxin. Uh, but the problem is, by definition, if they have 237 and 8 chlorines, then they, by definition, do not have two adjacent positions where the cytochrome can attack. So, as far as I know, the answer here is no. But that's something I've been thinking about because I have the data to investigate it. Uh, but as far as I know, they don't get metabolized. All right, uh, another, another case study. This is dechlorination of chlorinated ethylenes and benzenes in groundwater. Uh, this is my student, Stacy Capozzi's PhD dissertation. She was looking at uh, Chambers Works. This is, this is uh, the Delaware Memorial Bridge right here. So if you've ever driven across the Delaware Memorial Bridge and looked to the north, this is this big site called Chambers Works. It was uh, owned by DuPont, and then DuPont has now spun off a division called Chemours, which owns Chambers Works. But it's been active for a long time. They produced a lot of the chemicals there that helped us win World War II. But uh, when they were you know, trying to fight World War II, they weren't worried too much about chemical safety and waste disposal. So the waste disposal techniques at Chambers work were quite crude. They would just dump chemicals out the back door of the lab into a trench, you know, a system of ditches that would just drain them out into the Delaware River. Now, of course, more recently, they have a much better waste management system in place, but back in the early days, that's what they were doing. And so, of course, heavy things like tetrachloroethylene, they're denser than water, and so they would just, you know, percolate down through the ground until they hit some clay layer, and then they stop there, and they sit there underneath the, the Chambers Works site. So Chambers Works is, is uh, contaminated with all kinds of things because DuPont made everything. Everything that DuPont made they made at this site pretty much because they did a lot of their R&D here. So research and development, they were developing new products. So they did everything here. Freons, nylons, Teflon, explosives, radiological materials, dyes, everything you can think of they were making at this site. So it's a really interesting brew of stuff. Um, so a lot of the, the contamination there is chlorinated compounds. And so there's reason to believe that they could be dechlorinated by bacteria. And if they are, then DuPont slash Chemours would like to know that. They'd like to have some evidence that that's happening so that they can go to the state of New Jersey and say, look, biodegradation is happening, so we don't need to spend a lot of money cleaning this up because the bacteria are going to take care of it on their own. So DuPont uh, had been forced over the years to collect a lot of data on, on contaminants at their site. So they had a big data set. And so we wrote a proposal to say, look, you already have this data. You already paid to collect all this data. Why don't you let us use it? That way you don't have to go out and collect new data. You're just leveraging the big investment you've already made in, in analyzing all of these samples. So we said, we'll, we'll apply our data mining techniques to see if we can find evidence that the degradation is occurring and also under what conditions, where, when, why, how is degradation occurring? So we looked at. So here's the chlorinated benzenes. The main one that they were using at the site was 1,2-dichlorobenzene or ortho-dichlorobenzene. So it can be dechlorinated to the monochlorobenzene and to benzene. Um, and there was also a little bit of 1,2,4-trichlorobenzene at the site. So we ran our PMF model. We found a source term that has 1,2-dichlorobenzene in it. That's in the blue here. Uh, and then we found a fingerprint that has mostly chlorobenzene and 1,4-dichlorobenzene. That must be the degradation term. And then there's also one that has mostly chlorobenzene and benzene. Um, so what's really interesting, the PMF is not that exciting. And then, of course, you can also map the PMF results and show where at their site they're getting this degradation. But um, one of the things that was really interesting about the study is to do correlations with all these ancillary parameters that they had measured in the groundwater. 
They measured sulfide and sulfate, which tells us about sulfate reduction that's occurring. Uh, they measured nitrite, nitrate, methane, alkalinity. And then uh, one of the things they measured that was really interesting, they measured aniline and they measured nitrobenzene. And I'm not a microbiologist, but I, one thing I do know is that nitrobenzene gets reduced to aniline pretty readily by bacteria. And you can also go back the other way, too, under some circumstances. Aniline could be oxidized to nitrobenzene. So I thought this could be a really great redox indicator. Uh, and part of the reason why it's so great is that things like nitrite is very short-lived. Uh, nitrite is notoriously difficult to measure. Uh, notice we have dissolved oxygen and pH on here. You know, dissolved oxygen and pH are two of the things that you would think would be the easiest things in the world to measure. Because all you got to do is stick an electrode in your little water sample and it gives you a readout. That's all there is to it. The problem is that you're bringing up groundwater and as soon as you bring it up there and expose it to oxygen, it starts sucking oxygen out of the atmosphere. And so you can watch the DO increase as the probe sits there. Um, and pH is similar. The pH is changing constantly. As soon as you bring that, that water up and it starts to absorb oxygen and chemical reactions start to happen, the pH starts to change. So uh, DuPont had measured uh, dissolved oxygen and pH, but they warned us from the beginning that of all their data, that's probably the least reliable and you shouldn't put too much uh, credence in it. So that's an important message about, you know, sometimes you have data, but it doesn't mean it's good data. Um, so we, we're trying to find good redox indicators. And so the reason that the aniline and the nitrobenzene were so great is that, first of all, they're relatively long lived. If you take your sample of aniline and, you know, of your water out of the ground and it's got some aniline and some nitrobenzene, it's not immediately going to start oxidizing the aniline back to nitrobenzene. It's, it, that takes time. So it's stable. You can measure both aniline and nitrobenzene. And the other thing that's really great about it is that we're talking about chlorinated benzenes. Aniline and nitrobenzene got measured in exactly the same run. The same analysis that measured the chlorobenzenes was measuring, measuring the aniline and the nitrobenzene, which made it really, really useful. So we did uh, some correlations between these, these uh, three terms, you know, these, these three PMF factors that we had found, and we correlated them with our redox indicators. So this figure right here is a really interesting uh, story about data visualization, because poor Stacy went through probably a thousand iterations of this table. And so one of the things I told her to do was to organize her indicators here in terms of decreasing redox potential. So you have nitrite and nitrate at the top, that's nitrate reducing. Here, here's iron reducing conditions, sulfate reducing conditions, and methanogenic conditions. So as you go down, you're getting to more deeply reducing conditions, and that's why pH temperature and TOC are down here, because they really don't have anything to do with, with redox. Um, and then from left to right, we have the source, we have partial dechlorination and advanced dechlorination. And then the, the different colors, the dark colors, dark red and dark blue are strong correlations and the light red and light blue are, are less strong. They're P.05 versus P.005. Uh, but the red indicates a positive correlation and the blue indicates a negative correlation. So the way that we organize this, you should in theory see a swath of dark red from top left to bottom right and or a swath of dark blue from, from top right to bottom left. Okay, so that was the way that this was organized. Whether or not it worked so great, I'll let you figure that out yourself. Um, but you do see that the advanced dechlorination factor here is correlated with sulfide and methane. So that means very advanced uh, redox conditions, very reducing conditions are producing the more advanced dechlorination. And then the partial dechlorination here is correlated with the sulfate and sulfide, well, sulfate. So we think that that has to do with sulfate reduction. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the source term may be correlated with high PE, which means, you know, not very reducing conditions at all. So it does, it makes some sense. Uh, but that, again, it's a story about A, having good ancillary data so you could do these correlations, and B, showing it in a way that makes some sense to the reader. And notice here's N, this is the total number of samples. So like for nitrite, or excuse me, nitrate, we only had 33 samples. So maybe it's not surprising that there's no significant correlations. These are all in yellow. But now you see the beauty of using that aniline here. We had 418 measurements of aniline and nitrobenzene because they were measured at the same time as the chlorobenzenes. 
So we had somewhere around 400 and 500 or so samples total. I forget the total, the, the number of total samples. But, but we had aniline and nitrobenzene for most of them. So that's why that made a great redox indicator. So again, we're able to show that there is dechlorination happening and we're able to show where on the site and under what conditions. And then we did the same thing for chlorinated ethylenes. You guys have probably learned in this class that uh, when you have chlorinated ethylenes, PCE can get reduced to TCE, which goes primarily to cis, cis DCE is the number one thing here. I'm not very good with my, with my silly pointer, but anyway, cis DCE and then vinyl chloride and then ethene. And the big problem when you're trying to do the, the anaerobic dechlorination is that um, vinyl chloride you often get stuck at vinyl chloride and you can't reduce vinyl chloride all the way down to ethene. And the problem is that vinyl chloride is the most toxic of all of these, all of these chemicals. Vinyl chloride is the worst. And so this is the big problem. And that's why frequently they try to design systems where you also have the aerobic part here, which circumvents the production of vinyl chloride, or at least lets the vinyl chloride get, get eaten away, or destroyed. Um, and you end up with innocuous products if you're, if you're lucky. Uh, but this is only, you know, it's, it's rare that you're going to have a nice coupling of anaerobic and aerobic conditions. More likely you just have aerob anaerobic conditions all the time and you get stuck at vinyl chloride. So this is, this is one of the issues you're always trying to investigate. Um, so again, ran our PMF model. Uh, source term has PCE and TCE in it. Uh, here's your cis-DCE, so that's your partial degradation. Uh, notice that we summed up ethene and ethane and put them into the model as the sum of ethene and ethane. This is a good example of how you have to be smart. Uh, somebody who is a great data manager or data person, knows a lot of programming, would know how to do all this, but they wouldn't understand that it's important to sum up ethene and ethane uh, because bacteria can very readily convert ethene to ethane. That's not a problem for them. And so it makes much more sense to sum the two than to run them separately. And again, somebody who doesn't know anything about environmental science wouldn't know this and, and maybe would, would not uh, do as good of a job here. So we did a similar thing. We, we looked at uh, the correlations with all of these redox indicators. It's not as much to see here because we only had a total of 76 measurements, period, across all of the chlorinated ethylenes. So that's a story about how you know big data is called big data for a reason because you need a lot of it to get anything out of it. But you do see methane correlated with the advanced dechlorination product, and you do see, again, sulfate correlated with the partial degradation. So something, something going on there. Uh, okay, another case study, debromination of brominated diphenyl ethers. These are used as flame retardants. They look like this. Uh, sorry, this is very small, but uh, they're basically like PCBs, except instead of chlorine, they have bromine, and they have this oxygen right here in the middle. Okay, they're, they're a diphenyl ether instead of just uh, a, a diphenyl, a biphenyl. So BD-209 is the most common of them. Uh, BD-209 was very widely used and often is the highest concentration in places like sediment. So you see lots and lots of BD-209. But um, Tokars had done some laboratory studies and other people have done laboratory studies that have shown that BDEs can be debrominated by bacteria. Again, they're, the bacteria are using them as electron acceptors. There's a long debromination pathway down. One of the final products is BDE 17 down here. Notice uh, 47 and 49 and 99. 47, 49, and 99 are BDE congeners that are found in the commercial products. So they can both be products of debromination and they could also be from the original product. Uh, but BDE 17 is not found in the, the formulations. So shouldn't if you find BDE-17, it's, it's a marker that something's going on, probably debromination. So that's microbial, but it turns out that for BDEs, there's also photolytic debromination, that the sunlight can debrominate these. And it looks like one of the main products of the photolytic debromination is BDE-15. So instead of 17, it's 15. So my idea here was that maybe if I had a really good data set, I would be able to see the difference between the BDE-15 coming from photolysis and the BDE-17 coming from microbial debromination. And so this idea was ruminating in my head. I picked this up at a conference where somebody was talking about this. And so I was at the SeaTac meeting. I think it was in San Francisco. And I was talking with some of the guys who work for Access Analytical Services, which is like the best contract lab in the world. 
So I always try to talk to those guys whenever I get a chance. We're having some beers, and I said, uh, who's got the best BDE data in the world? And they said, San Francisco Bay. Absolutely, they have the best data. And it turns out San Francisco Bay also has a terrific online data portal where you can download all their data. So I did. I downloaded their data and I analyzed it. So this is BDEs and sediment from San Francisco Bay. And lo and behold, you get a fingerprint here that's dominated by BDE 15 and a fingerprint here that's dominated by BDE 17. So they're not, 15 and 17 are not correlated with each other because they're coming out in two completely separate factors. So that tells you there's two different pathways. BDE 15 and 17 are not present in the original formulations. So they must be coming from some debromination process and they're not correlated with each other. And so my interpretation is that, you know, the BDE 15 is coming from photolysis and the BDE 17 is coming from the microbial debromination. Now the reviewers argued with me and said, you can't say that for sure. <sighs> so, okay, I can't say that for sure, but that's my theory that the, this factor one with the BDE 15 is coming from photolysis and this factor three is coming from the microbial debromination. Add them together on a molar basis, you're getting about 13% of all the BDE is being degraded on a molar basis. So that's, again, it's not insignificant, it's, it's a real thing. And notice that BDE 17 here also has 47 and 49 and 99, which could be debromination products rather than being from uh, the, the original formulation. So not really sure there, but definitely at least two debromination pathways happening for BDEs in San Francisco Bay. Whether or not debromination is a good thing, we can argue about, that's a whole other issue. But uh, when you debrominate BDEs, you know, BDE 209 is so huge, it has a giant log KOW of around 10, which kind of puts it on the waning end of the bioaccumulation curves. But when you debrominate it, you move it this way, which moves you into the place where things are much more bioaccumulative. So you could be actually making things worse. And we don't really know anything about the toxicity of some of these products. So I can't tell you that debromination is a good thing, but I can tell you what's happening. All right, and then uh, one last uh, little case study I'm going to talk about. This is what I'm working on right now, so I'm all excited about it. Uh, perfluoro substances. This is what everybody wants to talk about, right? Now, the problem with these perfluoro compounds is that they don't really do anything. They don't react much at all because the, the, the big perfluoro part over here is pretty much, it's Teflon. It, it doesn't do anything. It does not react in any way, shape, or form. Although I think perhaps Donna might have talked to you about the fact that there are now, people have found in some laboratory studies that there is some defluorination that goes on, but that's only in the lab. I don't know of any evidence that that happens in the real world. So for our purposes, we will consider that the fluorinated part, the tail here, is completely inviolable, cannot do anything. So the only action, the only chemi chemistry that happens is here on the tail. And so... You have perfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS, which is sort of the generic term for all of these perfluoro compounds. And then you have perfluorooctanyl sulfonate, PFOS. I'll try to pronounce them differently, PFOS. Um, so this is PFOS, perfluorooctanyl sulfonate. And then there's PFOSA, perfluorooctanyl sulfonic acid, or so, so, excuse me, sulfonamide, because here's the amide part, right? So the point is PFOS can come from many different sources in the environment. Some of it is just used as PFOS and released as PFOS, but it can also come from some other precursors. And the precursors are not acids. They don't have this functional group. They're, they're, they have a, a, a separate chain there. So they're not acids and they have much higher vapor pressures. So these precursors can be emitted to the atmosphere and can travel through the atmosphere and then as they're traveling, they can react to form PFOS, okay? So that's one of the pathways that can form them. Plus there's all these other pathways that can just form, that can just uh, release PFOS directly into the, into the environment. And then PFOS, PFOS can be uh, interconverted back and forth with PFOSA, the, the amide here, okay? So there's some, there is actually some chemistry going on here, believe it or not. Um, 
so we, I'm, you know, I'm very interested in PFAS because that's what everybody's doing now. It's like the big hot thing. And so I said, well, I want to do some PFAS as well. I want to do some work with PFAS. And the hard part is finding good data because the, the techniques, the methods for measuring PFAS are, are evolving rapidly. And so there's not a lot of good data out there that's all been measured in the same way, using the same method, uh, measuring the same compounds, and on top of all that, without too many non-detects. Uh, students of my class will tell you that you very frequently find what you think is this terrific data set and then when you look at it more carefully you realize that like 99% of all the measurements are non-detects and that very frequently happens to you with PFAS. But I did manage to find one really great data set. Uh, as I often do, I went and trolled through the EPA's water quality portal looking for data, looking specifically for PFAS data. Um, and I found this study where the EPA had gone out and collected 139 samples of fish from the Great Lakes, from coastal waters around the Great Lakes, and they had analyzed them for 13 different PFAS compounds. They had very few or relatively few non-detects, so this is good data. And the thing that was really remarkable about it, I mean, it's terrific that they measured 13 PFAS. I mean, that's, that's a long list compared to other people who only measure like PFOA and PFAS, and that's it. So having 13 compounds was great. On top of that, they also measured the PCBs, the brominated flame retardants, and mercury. So this is a fantastic data set. And when I see a data set like this, like I go a little wild. Um, so I jumped all over this and started, started analyzing it. I wanted to think about what, what are the sources of the PFAS, and is there any of this metabolism of PFAS to PFOSA going on? Is this happening? So ran my PMF model like I always do, got five factors, most of it, 72% of the mass here is all the PFOS because that's very frequently the dominant PFAS compound that you find in the environment. Um, I'm not really 100% certain what factor two and three really represent. That's one of the tricky things about the PFAS is it's, they, I mean, and this is also in fish, which means that there could have been some alterations of the fingerprint. Um, this one, this factor four, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure, is those AFFFs, aqueous film forming foams that are used to fight fires. Uh, but then the fifth factor has got the PFOSA in it, right, right there. So it's basically PFOS and PFOSA. Uh, so these are my five factors. Could do lots of stuff with this. I mapped it all because I'm just trying to show off here that I know how to use ArcGIS because I'm very proud of myself. So here's the factor one, which is mostly PFOS. And notice how it increases from, basically from west to east, you kind of have a slow, constant increase. And yes, there's some variability, but, but there is, seems to be sort of this general increase. And there's not a whole lot of hot spots. I mean, there's maybe one here and maybe one there, maybe one there, but there's not a ton of hot spots. It seems to be just sort of a general increase from west to east. And so when you don't see a lot of hot spots and you see this general increase, that tells you you must be dealing with some sort of long-range transport, either via the water of the Great Lakes or via the atmosphere. So this could indicate that you're getting a lot of PFOS, PFOS, uh, from the degradation of precursors during their atmospheric transport. And you know what's right over here? That is Minneapolis. And you know what comes from Minneapolis? little company called Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, 3M. And 3M is the company that made all of these, or not all of them, but made a lot of these perfluoro compounds. So one of my theories is that 3M was making precursors that are then floating with the breeze across the Great Lakes. And as they're floating along, they're reacting to, to form PFOS. But that reaction takes a day or two. And during that day or two, this air has gotten, you know, over here into Huron and Erie and Ontario. When it's hitting here, and this is Duluth, by the way, by the time it hits Duluth, there hasn't been much reaction. But by the time it gets over here, we've had a lot of reaction. And this is where once the precursors, which are relatively volatile, form PFOS, which is not very volatile, then the non-volatile PFOS sticks to a particle and falls out of the sky. So that's one of my theories. Uh, note also, not a whole lot going on in the city of Chicago. Chicago is by far the largest city on the Great Lakes, and yet not that much contamination on its shores. And the reason is that the city of Chicago has a unique way of dealing with their wastewater. 
um, you know, Chicago has traditionally been the butcher of the world, right? There's that Carl Sandburg poem about how Chicago is the city of big shoulders, butcher to the world, providing meat to the world because all of the all the cows and pigs from all over the Midwest were trucked on rail cars into Chicago where they were butchered and then shipped out via the Great Lakes all over the world. So Chicago had a lot of people and had a lot of butchers and had a lot of waste. I mean, that those two things, put those two things together and you're talking about huge amounts of wastewater and raw sewage going into Lake Michigan, even in the early days of Chicago's existence. And they realized that this was a problem. And so what they did is instead of allowing the water to just naturally flow from places like Chicago into the Great Lakes, what they did is they went and they reversed the flow of all the water coming out of Chicago and sent it westward into uh, the Mississippi River. So it's a very strange situation where the city of Chicago is sort of hydraulically shut off from Lake Michigan. Anyway, I just digress. I thought that's, that was an interesting story. So this is the distribution of PFOS. Uh, and to give you a contrast, here's the distribution of that factor four, which I think is the, the aqueous film forming foams. Uh, you know, much more in you know, Superior. There's not a lot of people up here in Lake Superior. There's no people. So where's all that AFFF coming from? I think it's coming from, here's K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base. Here's Duluth Air Force Base, or Duluth Air Force, uh, or Duluth, excuse me, Duluth Airport. Here's another airport. Um, of course, here's the airports associated with Chicago. And then here's something called Wurtsmith Air Force Base, where we know they have huge amounts of, co of uh, AFFF contamination, which I think is explaining this hotspot that you're looking at right here. Um, so anyway, uh, this figure is, first of all, to show you the difference between hotspots, no hotspots. Here we have hotspots. In the previous slide, we did not. Uh, the second thing that this slide is intended to show you is that I am awesome because I can do all this stuff in Google Earth Pro where I put the airports on here and he yeah, has either airports, airports, and I also put the military bases on here. Here's Fort Drum and Camp Grayling. I'm so proud of myself. I, this was, this took me hours. Uh, anyway, so the point is, uh, once you have some GIS skills, you can do some of this data mining and you can start to look at relationships between hotspots and airports and things like that. Uh, and then the third map I'm going to show you, this is the P factor five, which has the PFOSA in it. Some hotspots kind of follows the trend though, where you have low concentrations to the west and high concentrations to the east, but you also have some hotspots. So maybe it's a combination of things. Anyway, um, the other thing, so the last thing I'm going to talk about, I know you're tired. I took this data and I said, OK, I have all this information about PFAS. But in the same fish, I have information about PCBs and about BDEs and about mercury. And I wanted to see if there was any correlations here. So I used a technique called stepwise regression that you can learn all about if you take my class. Um, and I wanted to regress. I did all. I did my factors. I regressed the, the the abundance of the five factors plus the concentrations of the individual PFAS compounds, and I also did the PFOS to PFOSA ratio. Uh, so those are all my Y terms. Each one of those is one Y. And then I, I had five X terms, total PCBs, total BDEs, total mercury. And then I also remember I talked about this ratio that I could use to establish how much metabolism of PCBs had occurred. So I regressed against that ratio. And then I also came up with the ratio for BDEs of 99 versus 100. So again, I think this is sort of a metabolism ratio, but remember for BDEs, it's not just cytochrome P450 metabolism. It could be deep rumination. It could be deep. Uh, photolytic debromination, so lots of things could be going on here. So I'm not, not as sure I understand what this means, but I thought, what the hell, you know, I'll make a ratio. Um, so I ran those, and so where you see colors on this plot, there was a significant correlation. In green, the correlation was significant and positive, and in red, the correlation was significant and negative. And if it's white, then there was no significant correlation. Uh, so again, I've got my five descriptors up here at the top. Uh, and then uh, down here, I have each of my different um, PFAS compounds. Uh, here's the PFOSA to PFOS ratio. Here's the five factors. And notice I did a forward 
and a backward stepwise regression, which again, if you want to take the class, you can learn all about the difference. Um, not important at this point. What's important is that, again, keep your eyes on the, this group right here, PFOS, PFOSA, and the, the ratio of the two. Positively correlated with mercury, negatively correlated with this PCB ratio, right? the, PCB, the ratio, the metabolism ratio for PCBs. So something is going on there. Uh, and also maybe some correlation with the BDE ratio. So something is going on there in terms of metabolism. Uh, so it could be metabolism in the sense of PFOS being converted to PFOSA and vice versa, you know, and back again. Uh, but so here's a lesson on, on calling in the experts when you don't know what the hell you're looking at. So I called in Keith Cooper, who's our resident expert on metabolism and also on PFA, PFAS fluoro compounds and I asked him you know wh what does this mean um, he, and he said it's not necessarily metabolism what it could be having to do with is once the cytochrome p450 stuff happens regardless of what's happening whether it's cytochrome p450 or whatever the way that mammalian cells and higher organisms get rid of these compounds is by conjugating them with a transporter protein which acts like a little tugboat and tugs them right out of the cell and it could be that you are, you know, having all this mercury around means that you are, uh, you know, more mercury means more PFAS. It could be that you are basically running out of transport proteins. Mercury doesn't undergo any reactions or not any important reactions. Mercury is just an element. And again, it's being measured here as total mercury, not methyl mercury, just total mercury. Uh, so as total mercury goes up, PFOSA and PFOS go up, that could mean that there's just not enough transport proteins around. The cell is overwhelmed with contaminants and they all build up. Uh, and something similar is happening with the PCB ratio. As the PCB ratio goes down, you have more metabolism. And so as the ratio goes down, the concentrations of these guys go up, right? The concentration of the PFOS and the PFOSA go up. So more metabolism means higher... Um, higher concentrations. Again, that could have more to do with the transport proteins that are supposed to transport the products out of the cell than it has to do with the PFOS itself. But either way, the point is something's going on. There's some relationship. There's some sort of, either whether you want to call it metabolism or transport or whatever you want to call it, something's going on that's affecting the PFOS concentrations in, this, in the organisms. And what, to me, what this is really a, a, a a, uh, example of is what you can do when first of all you have great data because this is such a great data set with the PFAS and the PCBs and the BDEs and the mercury all together in the same fish. When you have great data you can do great stuff. And then the other thing is you know to just think about it really hard to think about oh I could use a ratio here. I could use a ratio to characterize metabolism. So if you think hard and you have great data you can do really really interesting stuff. All right, that's enough. You're, you're exhausted. I've exhausted you. The takeaways are, uh, if you have big enough data sets, you can start to tease out some of these small things that are happening that can tell you about what is actually happening. So again, just to reiterate, laboratory studies can show you what is theoretically possible. Yes, it is theoretically possible that PFAS can be defluorinated in, the, in little bottles in the lab. But big data sets can tell you what is actually happening. And in some ways, to me, that's more powerful. But again, these, these are complementary approaches. You need both. Uh, it, but you to do this data mining and to get anything useful out of it, you need to know what to look for and how to interpret what you find. So you need to have this knowledge. Uh, so that's why it's great that you're taking this class. Uh, this is my sort of Confucian, you know, very deep uh, saying, you can only mine the data that exists. It's obvious, but true that uh, there's a lot of data I wish existed. There are things I wish they would measure. I wish they would measure the products of a lot of these uh, metabolism reactions, but they don't. You, you have what you have. You know, you go into battle with the data that you have, not the data that you wish you had. They never seem to measure what you really need. <laughs> it's always the one thing you really wish they measured that they hadn't done. Uh, and of course, they often don't measure products, so you have to find ways to getting around that. And that ancillary data, redox indicators, meteorology, fish length, you know, these are all the sort of hard things that can be very difficult to tease out. Um, so finally, I would say, uh, you know, it, it may sound, especially for those of you who haven't taken my class yet, it may sound like I did really sophisticated stuff to analyze this data. Not really. 
the tools that I use are pretty simple. They're really not that difficult. So it's not computing power. I mean, I, one of my PMF models might at most, at most, might take an hour. That's like the absolute longest. More likely 10, 15 minutes. Uh, so all of these analysis tools, I mean, th they exist. They're out there. R, I, you know, in my class, I teach you how to use R, which is a data analysis language. Um, it's free. It's all free. And the, the, the models that I use are all free and they're all open source. So there's nothing difficult about that per se. The real limitation when it comes to data mining is getting your hands on the data, finding the data that you want. This is the hard part. And frequently you find the data, but it's been managed so poorly. So like you don't know whether things are detected or not because there's no flag to tell you there's a number there. I don't know. Is it detect? I don't know. They don't tell you. You know, a lot of that, um, what we call metadata gets lost because of bad data management. So those are the limitations. Uh, the computing power of the analysis tools, that's easy. It's finding the good data. So my, my advice is go out and find the best data you can. Don't worry about the source of it. Just get the best data you can and then find a local partner. So when I was working in San Francisco Bay, I called up the guys who work for the San Francisco Estuary Institute and I asked them for help. You know, when I'm working in, I'm doing work in Newtown Creek, I pick up the phone and I call, or more likely I email, but I email the people who are in charge of Newtown Creek, the EPA people who are in charge of that site. I, when I was working at Portland Harbor Superfund site, I picked up the phone literally and called the EPA offices there and asked them, hey, I need help with, with uh, Portland Harbor Superfund site. Can you explain this to me? Uh, because you need someone who really understands how and why the data was collected and they understand the background of the site, the hydrology, the geology, the food web structure, the meteorology. Uh, you know, sometimes they need to understand the politics of who did what to who and why. So you need a local partner. Anyway, that's the end of my spiel about how you can use data mining to understand biodegradation of contaminants. And if you find all this utterly fascinating, then you should take my class next fall uh, which is called environmental science analysis. And I, I guarantee you, everybody loves it. All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And uh, I will see you on the other side.